Hello and welcome to our latest edition of Bulldogs Unleashed with two very special guests this week, thanks to Reclaim the Game. Craig Sandercock, a member of our coaching staff now at the moment looking after the Harvey Norman women's team and one of the most popular players to pull on a Bulldogs jersey, Sam Perrett. Thanks for joining us, boys. No worries, Thanks, We're going to have a quick look at uh, what's taken place this week and the upcoming game. We're also going to look at the art of coaching. We're going to take a deep and meaningful look at that. And we'll also talk about the respective careers of these two guys. Uh, took quite interesting paths, both in coaching and playing, from a, a very interesting period in the Dogs' history, 2012 onwards. But all that is coming up. Now, first of all... Convincing win to Parramatta at the weekend and a masterclass from one Mitchell Moses and two Clint Gutherson. Mitchell, of course, uh, playing his way into the state of origin side. Sandy, as a member of the coaching staff, um, your thoughts on the Dogs' performance on the long weekend Monday? Yeah, I thought um, we were in it for, for long periods of the game, Bill. Um, we competed really hard, just, you know, a couple of couple of defensive errors there, I suppose, um, leading a couple of tries, but... You know, I think, you know, we moved the ball quite well and look quite dangerous. But, yeah, those couple of defensive errors, I know Ciro wouldn't have been happy with those. He did cite uh, 54 missed tackles. He said the opposition tries came in bursts. He even swore in the post-match news conference, I think for the first time, anyway, the first time I've heard him swear this season anyway, when he talked about lack of effort off the ball. And that's an interesting one we want to get on to too. And he singled out some of the least experienced players as being the best on the day, in terms of effort anyway. Uh, and that can make the solutions to the problem a little more complicated, as I think uh, Craig Sandercock would agree. But Sam, uh, your thoughts on that? We keep talking about the rebuild, and there's this mixture of players each week trying to find solutions to some of these problems. And your observations of that so far? Yeah, I guess it's all part of the fun of um, being in a team. And, you know, when you're down and out, it, everyone's trying to get creative, trying to figure out what the problem is especially the coaching staff. Um, the guys don't sleep very well, but, um, you know, that's that's part of the, uh, I guess, the excitement. And then when you start putting some, stringing some wins together and you start cracking the code, I think, um, you know, all the more uh, excitement and rewarding when you've gone through all these tough times. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, I'm sort of glad I'm not in that, <laughs> in that environment anymore. <laughs> but, yeah, went through plenty of those times ourselves, those rebuilds and, you know, you have these great errors followed by basically a bunch of young guys. Maybe some of the, the core groups moved on to different places and um, or finished up. So, um, yeah, it's just a natural process and part of the uh, part of the NRL journey. But there's some senior players, Craig, that are better at handling younger players around them than others. Uh, there's a certain amount of leadership involved in that, and you can't expect that from everyone. Yeah, definitely, Bill. You're right. Um you know, some of the great leaders, you know, of, of clubs I've been at, like uh, I suppose at Newcastle, your Kurt Gidleys, um, that they, they treated, you know, the young players as they would, you know, experience play, you know, and you know here, you know, Josh Jackson, I suppose, mm. is a great example of that here. So, you know, you can be a senior player uh, in games, but to be a senior player, in my opinion, you need to be uh, lead the culture. You need to. Yeah, set the example, I suppose, in everything you do on and off the field. And, you know, you need to uh, spend time with the younger players, whether that's doing extras after training, whether it's having a chat to them, um, you know, socially, I suppose. Um, that That's, to me, a senior player. I don't know what Sam thinks about that, but a lot of people say, oh, I've played 100 games, so I'm a senior player. Well, to me, you're not. Mm. Uh, unless you're leading the culture of that club and, and developing, you know, the next wave of that club. Oh, I don't think you are. Uh, Sam, what do you, what I, do you think? Mate, I absolutely agree. Uh, if I look back on my career, if there was one thing that I wish I had done better, it would have been a better leader. I wish I had have, um, you know, I, I focused a lot on getting my job right, doing mm. doing my role in the team, and I felt like I, I got that pretty consistent. And for the most part, I was happy with my efforts. But looking back on it, I would rather have lifted, you know, 16 other boys mm. as opposed to just – focusing on just my game and yeah and i agree sandy it's it, that's that's what a true leader is someone who sets the culture um i've seen one guy come into a club one particular player come in and it just changes the whole dynamic for, for the better and that's the power of someone who's a true leader and someone who inspires and, and that and that brings me to the next point i was going to make too because we live in an era now of keyboard warriors we also live in an era and this show is sponsored by reclaim the game where a lot of people are betting on 
on football matches and and a lot of their talk on social media, a lot of the punters' opinions revolve around uh, their betting on the game, which is a sad indictment of, of how we view uh, a sport. That's that's one aspect, which we can talk a lot more about on another date. But generally speaking too, even those who haven't had a punt, they're passionate supporters, but they don't often read the game as well as they probably should. A player can get a lot of criticism, but it's not necessarily his or hers fault at the time. A lot has to do with the components around them. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I just see in, in, in the press that, you know, Tavita's copped a bit of bit of flack for a couple of those, you know, defensive, I suppose, uh, errors. But, you know, the way that, you know, Ciro's built the system, they're, they're, there's there's a plan B and there's a plan C. And, mm. you know, Tavita needed help around him, which uh, is a bulldog system, and that help wasn't there. So it just exacerbated the error that, to Vita made yeah. um, by other people not doing their job either. And, you know, when you've got a defensive system, then everyone needs to be part of that system. Um, and, and I suppose that's, a, that's an example. Other extreme of that is, Sam, can you be trying too hard if you're a senior player? Taking too much on yourself, maybe overplaying? I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a fine balance in high-performance sport or anything high-performance really, and, and especially in a team environment. There's, if you take on too much, you're going to burn out. It's only a matter of time, you know, we're – we're all human. We can only tolerate with so much. So, uh, you know, the balance is putting in your your effort, making sure your role's covered, and then bringing the rest of the guys, you know, bringing them all up, everybody sharing the load. That's, you know, that's the reality of a team. There are some sports um, where a key player needs to say, give me the ball. In rugby league, uh, that that is true a lot of times too, but... You can overplay that as well, can't you? I mean, we've seen examples of it in many clubs uh, and, and even in representative teams over the years. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's about giving me the ball, but I think it's just about doing your job. Yeah. You know, if everyone does their job, then that'll happen naturally. Um, you know, and if you're just demanding the ball because you haven't touched the ball or, or you feel that you need to make an imprint in the game, that's, you know, that's when errors can occur yeah. or, or breakdowns, I suppose. And rugby league, in more than a lot of sports, um, it's so systematic in the way it's played. Because uh, w- what came to mind was I'm thinking in basketball. You know, quite often a senior, a good shooter, can take the ball and say, "Look, just give it to me, and I'll I'll make the shots." Rugby league's not that kind of game. You can't just pass it to the guy who tends to make line breaks, and he'll do it every time, or she'll do it every time. It's not that simple. No, the old adage, you know, you pass the ball to someone in a better position, you know, than <laughs> exactly. yourself. Yeah, you know, he's a go or. You know, or the other one is, you know, you don't put your pressure on someone else because you're feeling the heat from, from you know, inside pressure doesn't mean you just pass the ball. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it is a little bit different, I suppose. And the same with tackling as well, uh, putting yourself out of position because you don't trust your teammates. It's not of a good structure, is it? Uh, Cronulla this weekend, um, they were really touched up by the storm. Nico Hines didn't have a great game. In fact, uh, arguably it cost him his position in the State of Origin squad. Um although he didn't get a lot of game time and certainly out of position in, in game one of State of Origin. We'll talk about State of Origin in a tick, but he has a point to prove and he's the kind of player who can do it, a Dally M player of the year. So not an easy time to face the Sharks, Sam. No, absolutely not. And um, I guess looking back on uh, some times where we've faced someone who's been down and out but they're capable of so much, these are um, these are also exciting opportunities, you know, for our, for our young side and uh, our boys who are trying to, trying to grow, trying to improve. Um, I think it's exciting. You know, it's a big opportunity. You know these guys are going to turn up and it's going to be a big battle. And I think too for the fans, you know, I think they'll be expecting a, a bit of a show. What are your thoughts, Craig? What do you say to a young Bulldogs team playing a team like Cronulla in this situation? Yeah, everyone talks about the bounce back factor, don't they? And I suppose Melbourne certainly bounced back against Cronulla. But <laughs> the other side of the coin is when you get beaten by a big score and, you know, it's happened to... Happened to me a lot, a lot of times, unfortunately. Well, it's um, happened to a lot of teams this year. It, it, it doesn't matter who you are or how experienced you are. There's always that self-doubt that creeps in when you are beaten and by that. And there's always that confidence factor. Mm. Um, so sometimes, you know, although you're expecting a bounce back, the, the confidence may be a little bit lower than, than what it may have been. And, and then you think yourself that split second before you throw that pass, should I throw it? Mm. So all of a sudden you've been beaten by a big score and the next week you say, oh, I might not try that play now. Yeah. So you go on the shell a little bit more. So I think it's a great opportunity for the Bulldogs to to come out and, and, and play some really good footy and, and you know, sh- show Cronulla. And obviously as a coach, when you look at where Cronulla struggled, 
in that game. You want to pick at that wound a little bit, don't you, just to see if, if there's still that doubt there and, and maybe you can exploit that. I mean, chances are they'll, they'll fix their mistakes, but you've got to keep trying, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. There's no, no doubt, you know, Sarah and the coaching staff will pinpoint where they think, you know, they can win. Um, you know, it's going to be a tough game, obviously. Playing at Sharp Park is uh, it's never easy, but, you know, I think it's a decent time to get them, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, a couple of their players, you know, their confidence may be not what they're at. Um, mm. You know, a couple of a couple of players there miss some, miss some tackles that, that, you know, we might want to want to exploit, I suppose. So, yeah, it's, it's a really good opportunity. Now, Sam, looking at the bigger picture a bit, the Roosters went from Wooden Spoon in 2009 to a grand final in 2010. Uh, you were in those teams. I just want to point out too that in, in, in 2009, Braith, Willie, Nate Miles and Ogre, Mark O'Mealy, were in that side. Uh, Ogre and Willie did leave by 2010 and Brian Smith took over from Freddie Fittler as coach. So, But what I'm getting at is that is a massive transition. You didn't finish you, – you, you weren't high up the top eight. I think you were sort of – a little bit below, I think you're fifth or something like that. But uh, the, there wasn't a lot of points difference. You, you're right up the ladder. You're in position and got to a grand final. What was the difference from one year to the next? What, I'm sure there were plenty, but what was the most significant difference? Yeah, well, I think, like you say, the um, the team, you know, the, the core team's still the same. So it's, it's really interesting. Um, and I actually see it a little bit in the, the current Rooster squad where, um, you know, They've still got a very strong squad, but just things aren't clicking. Mm. And, it, yeah, it's, it's one of those, um, you know, if you had the answer to that, you know, I'd, I'm sure you'd be the best best coach or the best captain, you know, out in the NRL. So um, it, it's amazing just how that little switch can happen. But um, I sort of go back to, um, yeah, well, there's a few things. So one, we had uh, Brian Smith came in. So mm. it was his first year there. It was like a fresh start. Everyone was excited. Um, you know, it was new. Um, so that was one. That was one factor. Just the fact that it was a, it was a blank slate, um, and is that, the, is that the word blank canvas? Yeah, clean, clean slate, slate, blank canvas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, mixing the two <laughs> together. Um, but also too, what Sandy brought up earlier was is that culture. Um, I still believe. Um, yeah, from looking back at my experience, I think culture is a huge, mm. a huge, huge thing with how your team performs. Uh, I remember when I first debuted. Uh, in 2004, when uh, the doggies took it out, um, all three uh, sides, the jersey flag, the reserve grade and the first grade at the Roosters all went to the grand final mm. um, and everyone won uh, except for the, the Bulldogs cleaned up in the grand final. Um, but I, I put that down, that success at that club at that time, I put that down to the culture that uh, Ricky Stewart and Freddie Fittler had set. Mm -hmm. Like as a captain... He would. He had the ability to slap you across the face and give you a kiss on the cheek at the same time. You know, right. was, you just had ultimate respect for these guys, and they weren't afraid to to tell you to shut up in the middle of, um, you know, a team meeting if someone was whatever. Yeah, they'd pull you back in line real quick. So I reckon that the culture. I reckon the culture is huge. I mean, you look at some of the the teams that have been so consistent for years. They've just got this consistent culture, and it's a a high performing culture as well. So. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to uh, the doggies just getting that culture, just just bringing it up, and you know Sandy and Sarah and and all the team just developing that as as a coaching staff and as a playing squad. Everyone has to sort of contribute to that. Mm. And what do you reckon, Sam? In terms of success, is it is it better to be play driven that culture? Played absolutely. Mm. Yep, I, I think so. I've I've never been a coach, yeah. but. Um, that's one thing I looked forward to as a business owner in our construction company. I uh, and I've I've already made plenty of mistakes as a leader in, in in our company. But one thing I love is I love getting the team to contribute to yep. what plays are we doing, how are we putting this wall together, mm. who's got some better ideas here, and it's amazing what everyone yep. comes up with. But once one of the team members come up with, you know, let's let's put up a wall frame this way, everyone's like, yeah, that's a great idea. That's actually going to be a lot more efficient than how we were going to do it. But then there's just this buy-in, and they own it. Yeah, and and then they'll coach each other. So yeah, I, I think it's I, I like it. I, it takes the pressure off me as the the business owner operator, um, and everybody's just contributing. And I, I dare say it would be similar as a coach. Yeah, I agree. And I suppose that's getting back to what we we're talking about earlier. That that to me, Sam, what makes a senior player a really good senior mm. player. He's he's helping you know drive that culture or standards, whatever you want to call it, in, in the joint. 
We're talking to Craig Sandercock and Sam Perrett. This is Bulldogs Unleashed. Uh, when we come back, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about state of origin and further down the track, we're going to look at coaching in a bit more detail and we'll also be talking about the dog days for these two guys. Uh, my name's Braden Burns and I play for the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. I love playing footy because um, obviously I've played it since I was a kid. Yeah, the fans are obviously really important to every footy player. We go out and we play for the fans and the members especially. You hear um, the fans obviously when they're giving it to you on the sideline. As a young kid I was pretty easily influenced and um, I sort of got into gambling a little bit, not too bad, but um, I guess it just takes away from the game. You don't sort of sit there and watch the game for what it is and enjoy those special moments and, and sort of support your team. You're more worried about your multis. Yeah, I'm really proud that the Bulldogs as a partner would reclaim the game. Um, I'm someone who, who's sort of gotten off betting. I'm really proud to say that um, that's something that I've sort of walked away from and um, I'm proud to be a part of it. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. Reclaim the game. Be gamble aware. This week's headlines. Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Our guests are Craig Sandercock and Sam Perrett. Let's talk about state of origin. And once again, Josh Adokar selected, the only Bulldog in the side, in either of the sides. Um, how resilient is Josh Adokar? Mate, you've played a lot in that position uh, in your career. He's managed to come back from injury, jump straight into the New South Wales team. And with limited opportunities, it must be said, back in the NRL, there's a lot of respect for him. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think... Uh Looking at the Fox, you, you don't see any um, deviation with how he his effort, how he plays. Um, I just think he's been consistent, and, and that's what it takes to be a um, you know a top performing player and someone who's going to be in the game a long time. You know, uh, so long as you stay healthy. So um, yeah, it's just a credit to him, and he's. I think whether he's selected or not, he's going to keep doing that, which is you know that's why we love him. Well, that's the thing, Craig. Mm. You've coached him. Yeah. Um, what's it like? The Fox, he, he comes across as, you know, very jovial and happy-go-lucky, but he's actually really intelligent. Uh, he knows the game inside out. And um, and he's a winger. He, he's <laughs> a winger. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Um, so <laughs> I had to say that was Sammy. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was at the Tigers when we gave him his debut in first grade, and, you know, I'll just never forget um, there was a kickoff, and he actually got the ball doing a post-training session, and he has got the ball from the kickoff and just – ran through the entire forward pack and scored a try. I think, oh my God, this kid can play. And then, <laughs> you know, we played the Warriors um, later that year in New Zealand and, and we're down by two points, about five minutes to go, and there was a scrum 10 metres out from our line. He did the same thing. He just <laughs> ran through the whole Warriors team and scored a length of field try, won us a game, and uh, he's, just, he's just a freak. But, you know, the thing is he, he works so hard his game. That's what mm. people, I suppose, don't see. He works so hard and... You know, he's really intelligent and, you know, that persona, that happy-go-lucky persona, it's, uh, it's, it's totally different when he's, when he's at training. He, he kind of nails it, though, in terms of the entertainment factor. Occasionally you'll get the Indigenous dance and all those things, but it's so appropriate. He, he seems to have that energy. And as you said, Sam, even if the team's not going very well, um, it's still, his behaviour still seems appropriate for the occasion, if you know what I'm saying. It, it's... It, it, it's inspiring as well as entertaining. It, it doesn't appear to be selfish at any time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely, and that's part of that culture. You know, you want to have some, you want to have some fun there, and you know, despite um, wherever the team is, whether it's up or down, yeah, you, you want to have those, um, you want to have those characters, and you want to have something mm. to enjoy and look forward to. Because some guys, I guess, Craig can be a little bit difficult to coach, and. I think now about the classroom and what I was like, uh, constantly writing on the report card, this this kid is a distraction to everyone else. Um, so <laughs> are there players like that as well? Yeah, there are a few players, I suppose, you'd write the re report card, <laughs> not quite yet achieving their full potential. Yeah, oh, I got that as <laughs> is well. Is that what you got, yeah. Bill? Yeah, yeah, I got that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Even though I was a teacher on both counts. Every play is different and, you know, and talking about teaching, I suppose – you know, now, now, Bill, if you're at school now, they'd have a differentiated curriculum for you. You'd be totally separate. And that, that's, that's kind of what he's at NRL level now. It's yeah. every play is different in how they learn. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's tests done on the plays to see how they, how, how they learn the best and, mm. and what method is. And um, you ought to treat, treat them all differently in, the, in that way. Um, you know, some, some learn by, you know, actually taking them on the field and direct them, you know, around the park. Some, some learn by, by watching the video. Mm. Um, you know, so, some learn, you know, by, by reading the playbook. You know, it's, every, everyone's different. You've got to treat them treat them differently. And uh, I think Sam will tell you the amount of characters he's, he's probably played with, they all, all learn in different ways. And, and, you know, it's just as a coach, I suppose, it's it's finding that, that switch that best uh, helps them develop as a player. 
Who's the biggest pest you've ever played with? Oh, there's a few. Uh, <laughs> I can think of one, but I won't say. Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think to me directly, like it was, uh, yeah, I'd never got too bothered by anything. I just thought it was all fun. But um, I don't know, they, there was definitely guys that would stir up um, other players in the team pretty well. Um, I don't know, but. I don't mean in a bad way either, just quietly. I mean, you yeah, know, guys yeah. who are entertaining and, and just fun to be around. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, gee, who we had. Um, you did play with Willie. Willie, Mace. Mace was, he's, <laughs> he's good fun on and off the field. He just, he can just make anyone laugh, anyone smile. He's, he's, he's good value. Because you know how conservative Has was when he was playing and he's been on the show a couple of times. He always used to love Willie's humour because it was just so different. Uh, to what he'd experienced, especially when Haz was, you know, a younger player as well. So, Well, that um, that 2009 year where we were a wooden spoon at the Roosters, Mace, I remember this one training session, he's turned up, everyone's like just down in the dumps and then he's just jumped into, uh, you know, the team van. Uh, he's just gone and then he's just started pumping one of the one of the jams and he's just, it just automatically <laughs> everyone just started feeling happy and he's just sitting there, you know, nodding his head. <laughs> Rapping, rapping to whatever the lyrics were, it was, it was just stuff like that. It just brightened everyone. Quickly back to State of Origin. I mentioned Mitchell Moses uh, tearing up the dogs yesterday, our time. But um, can he do it for New South Wales? Your thoughts on that? Oh, I hope so. Being, being <laughs> New South Wales for myself, um, he has matured a lot um, and he's been playing some really good footy. And, and I think the best part of his game actually has been his game management. Mm. Um, his skin game's always been good, but... I really feel like um, he's directing on the Parramatta side, you know, around really well and uh, fingers crossed he, he can get the job done for us. Sam, your thoughts? I know that I'll get onto it in a minute too because not having the option to play State of Origin back in the day, but um, how do you see game two? It's going to be an uphill climb for New South Wales though. Yeah, definitely. I um, We are having a chat uh, just the other day with a bunch of uh, workmates and uh, it's just – I just think it's uncanny how – you know, when everything just seems done and dusted for Queensland, these guys just, they just pull out stuff out of the hat. It's just, yeah, it's, you want to cry and you want to laugh at the same time. It's, um, it's really entertaining, but obviously massive challenge for the Blues. Um, yeah, and I think um, what you were saying, you know, Mitchell Moses, he's, they're just starting to hit this maturity, you know. Mm. Um, there's him and a few other players of that similar sort of generation. Yeah, they just get to that point where they just start becoming a lot mm. more mature. Um, they sort of rely on the team and get the best out of the team, kind of like what we were talking about, mm. being better leaders as opposed to um, maybe trying to take on too much themselves. But yeah, you see that you see that coming through from him. So yeah, I think it'll be a, um, I think it'll be exciting, and I think he's going to be you know he's probably going to rise to the occasion. You'll probably see the best of him. Twenty one games for New Zealand uh, couldn't play State of Origin. We've got Brits, not as many as we have Kiwis, of course. Pacifica players, although. Queensland and New South Wales sometimes find a way to get those guys into the mix. But, look, the bottom line is not everyone's eligible for State of Origin. Is there a solution, Sam, or are you just kind of happy with the way things are? Because oh. we've got some pretty good rep rounds now with the involvement of Tonga and Samoa, Fiji, of course, uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, they all get an opportunity now. It's getting better. Um, there could be a Pacifica team at some stage that's, that's been talked about. It's been quite successful in Super Rugby, I must say. So, I don't know, your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I think they're doing a great job with all the different games and the representations and the nations out there. I think it's really cool. Um, I always wanted to play Origin. That's that's something I, I played um, Queensland Schoolboys actually played Schoolboys and then um, was was able to represent Australia. And then, that's in Queensland. Yeah, so yeah, you, was, you were a Queensland supporter. Yeah, yes, yeah. Oh, no, a Kiwis lander. I, I go by <laughs> Kiwis lander. That's a good one. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I did all my schooling at Palm Beach Corumbin there. So yeah. Um, yeah, that what was a great really, place to grow up. Oh, it was lovely. Yeah. But, then, but then I ended up playing New South Wales 19s. So, you know, with the likes of Dan Conn, who was a doggy at the time. Uh, we had uh, Todd Carney, Filetti Matteo. So, yeah, it was, it was a really, that was a really cool squad to be a part of. That and is I, a handy team, yeah. The New South Wales residents and then Kiwis. So I was trying to – I've got ancestry all from England, so I was trying to play for England as well. I almost got there. <laughs> You did pretty well for New Zealand, mate. I think you should be very proud of that heritage. Oh, oh definitely. It was good. Uh, well, good luck to both teams as we approach State of Origin, of course. When we come back on Unleashed, we're going to go in the sheds, and that means we'll go a little bit more deeply into what it's like for Craig Sandercock now coaching the women's team and 
more pertinent, uh, perhaps, is how tough it is for the women playing today when they still have full-time jobs as well. And we'll also be talking to Sam about life after footy and further down the track, some memories of the dog days with these two guys. It's all coming up. Let's go in the sheds. Welcome back to Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Let's go in the sheds now with, firstly, Craig Sandercock, because you're coaching the Harvey Norman women's team for the Bulldogs. Well, first of all, we've had Barry Ward on, who's overseeing the program, telling us how it's progressing, and it's an interesting development phase because we're building towards an NRL team, and there's a lot of work goes into that. But I first want to ask, you've coached Super League, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, you've been assistant coach at four NRL clubs. No, five. Yep. Yep, five yep. NRL clubs. Um, and Barry did make reference to the fact that uh, these these people you're coaching now have got full-time jobs. It's like going back to the 1970s uh, in terms of the NRL or New South Wales Rugby League or Queensland Rugby League. How has that been for you as a coach? Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting, um, especially coming from a full-time environment for the last 20 years to uh, girls that you know, are part-time. But um, you just have to, I suppose, wind things back a bit and perhaps not go into the, into the detail that you'd go into and, and then you have to try and cram in, you know, what you'd probably do in six hours with the NRL team into into two hours w- with the girls, I suppose. And um, but to the girls' credit, they they just want to learn, they just want to get better, and and, and they sacrifice so much um, in, in terms of you know finishing work early, I suppose. Or, or some of them have jobs where you know they're up at three a.m. so they can finish their shift by ten in the morning, so mm. have the rest of the day off. So it, it is challenging, um, but. Um, you know, the girls, the girls did a really good job of it. And there's so many of them coming into the mix now. Um, you, you've been watching from a distance as a rugby league fan for a number of years and, and basically it's the old base of the pyramid argument, isn't it? There are so many women playing rugby league now that you can just see the standard um, lifting. It's like any sport, doesn't matter what the gender is. The more people you've got playing the game, the better you're going to be at the peak. Yep, correct. You're just going to get more numbers, more involvement and then the best of the talent's always just going to pop up to the top. But yeah, something I, I really love about uh, watching the NRLW is the, uh, I don't know if it, it just seems to be this, this um, they don't have this, uh, what's this, it's like self-preservation. Uh, they, they just <laughs> they just go 100 mile an hour and it's it makes it really entertaining. Yeah, because they just run and they just bash each other. And yeah, I don't know, something where I feel like I, I as a player would have been a little bit more cautious or slowed down or sidestep. They just, they just take it head on. So there's... You know, massive contact, massive uh, tackles. Well, B- B- Barry made reference, and he didn't use this word, but he was kind of saying it's a more honest game. Is that because the players are still grounded by the fact that they've got full-time jobs and they're just playing footy for the love of it? I don't know. Does that change the culture of how you play when you actually are doing it for out of passion and, you know what I mean, rather than for your paycheck? Yeah, I suppose. Um, you know, w- when you're full-time, you obviously can dig down deep into every aspect of the game, especially, you know, if you're alluding to the wrestle, I suppose, or, well, that's or, or not, defensively yeah. there. I was going to ask you about um, that. There are certain finer points of the yeah. game that maybe the the men, uh, I don't know what term to use. It's not overcoaching, but it's it's it can actually bog the game down a bit, can't it? When 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 the coaching's to such a degree where you're counter, countering everything um, and the game's not open. I don't know. Yeah, certainly – you know, part part time has got a lot to do with the build because, as I said, you can't you can't quite drill down mm. as much as I suppose you'd, you'd like to. But the other thing is, you know, the more the girls play, the the as you said, the the more girls that start playing the game, um, the more NRLW sides come in the competition. I think you'll see it at change a little bit more and and possibly be a little bit more structured. Um, dare I say it, the wrestle. Will start to creep in a little bit more, and we'll um, probably like it less. <laughs> I'm just saying, possibly could, but, but a lot of as you know, Sam was saying before, Bill, I, I sat down on the sideline a lot of the games this year, and some of the contact, I just it is <laughs> my God, there's no I disputing could, that. I yeah. just could not believe it. Mm. Um, it's just as Mate. full on as any any men's game I've been a part of. It's just my yeah, it's really I was really impressed with, with the with the girls' game and and the dedication and. The fearlessness. Uh, maybe the solution is to get all the blokes to have full-time jobs. <laughs> 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 then their game might be a bit more open and entertaining. <laughs> I'm not saying the NRL isn't entertaining, don't get me wrong. Um, Sam, you went straight from a playing career into business uh, and a successful one at that, which, you, you, as you mentioned, you're running a construction company. 
Did you ever consider coaching? Um, yeah, it didn't take me long to figure it out though. <laughs> Look, I'm, I am not envious of what Sandy and, and the guys well, this do. This bloke's only 25 years That's old. That's right. I was going to say, <laughs> Sam's got a beautiful head of hair there. I, I was just like that before I started coaching, so you don't want to, you don't want to look like me, mate. Oh, mate, it is, a, it is a tough gig and I've got nothing but respect for our coaches. Um, you know, just every one of them, um, you just saw so much highs and lows and, um, I remember a conversation I had with Freddie actually in terms of um, him being a coach versus a player. Mm. He said that it was so much more satisfying to win as a coach. That's I, I don't know if you agree with that, Sandy, but that's that's what he um, he shared. That was at the Roosters, and um, yeah, I, I found that very interesting. Yeah. But he obviously it just shows that there's a lot more time, thought, passion, uh, you know, mm. hair follicles. Yeah. <laughs> it all goes into the coaching and the team. That's an interesting point. And is it also perhaps too that you feel connected to everyone, whereas as a player maybe it's not quite the same? I don't know. Yeah, I suppose as a, as a coach, especially at NRL level, you you do so much analysis of opposition, opposition side. You feel like you know them just as much as your, your own side. So you spend so many hours working out how to beat them. And, you know, when it actually works, when it comes off, it's, it is, it's, it's a beautiful feeling, I suppose, and... Then you get um, shots of, of Craig Bellamy in the window <laughs> when it hasn't come off. Probably yeah. something he's told them a hundred times that week. I don't know, but <laughs> then you see yeah. the reaction. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, definitely a roller coaster. It's never a dull moment. Yeah, um, that, that's for sure. It's, um, yeah, but what about yeah. that, Sandy? What if you've told the boys a certain thing or the girls a certain thing, and and like Woodsy just said, they haven't done it, but you saw it was there. Like, how's that? That's not a pleasant feeling, either, Sam. <laughs> that happens all the time as well, and. You know, and some, you can't say give me the ball either. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, you, you end up going home and think, why did I just spend 80 hours this week analysing opposition? I might as well just not done anything. Said, boys, just turn up on game day and, and do your best because, yeah, yeah it's, it's frustrating. It certainly is frustrating. You, you weren't coaching, but how did you find life after footy, Sam? Did you have, did you have this business path planned? What, how did that work? Yeah, ever since I was a, a teenager, before I even um, got into full-time footy, it was uh, instilled by my dad. He just said, look, mate, you know, you've got to have a, a career outside of footy. Mm. Uh, whether you have a short career or a long career, you, it's still in your work life, it's still a very small sort of, you know, window. So, um, yeah, I always had that mentality and I always loved um, – my first job was, was in construction as a labourer for my uncle and I always knew that's what I loved to do. I loved, mm. you know, starting with a project and then standing back at the end of it you had this beautiful landscape done. Yeah. You know, this pool looked just pristine. Um, so that that's always been a passion of mine. And, yeah, and I pretty much just got stuck into that from the get-go, did my carpentry straight into a builder's ticket and then started taking on on jobs. And actually, uh, Gav Lester, he's an ex-bulldog uh, yep. and, and rooster as well. I, I met him at the Roosters and he sort of um, mentored me through all that. Oh, okay. So he had his own business and was doing exactly that. So I just followed his path. Wow. Yeah. And uh, did you find the discipline of being a professional rugby league player and the hard work and the teamwork, did that help transition in, into being a leader in the business field? Yeah, absolutely. And, and once you've been in, you know, uh, the NRL and such a high-performing, you know, such a competitive environment um, with this pressure all the time, you know, you've, I've got nothing but respect for anyone that, that coaches mm. or plays in this, in this code. Um, and I always, like, I've had uh, Aaron Gray, who played for, um, I knew him as a ball boy at the Roosters, then he ended up playing at Salves and at the Sharks. Um, and um, his wife, um, Penny Tani, uh, Tiana. She, oh, Tiana, right. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So um, I used to see them walking past one of our job sites. And then yep. um, when he was, I found out one time that he was available to, to come and help us work, and I said, mate, get in there. <laughs> so I, I, I have nothing but respect and admiration for anyone who plays a high-performance team – Team sport or or um, or role, you know that they they're going to contribute. Yeah. You know, so I I see that in any NRL player. Yeah, uh, we've seen another head coach in the NRL recently lose his job, and the Dragons are still yet to confirm as we speak now. Anyway, a replacement for Anthony Griffin. But Craig, everyone has an opinion on whether a coach is good or not, and we see the journalists talk about it. We talk about these things all the time on these formats, but it, it is so hard to really define. No, no one really ever knows, do they? Uh, and I get whispers from all sorts of people and opinions, but no one ever really knows why a coach is successful or, or not successful. Um, well, I guess maybe I'll preface that, 
sometimes we can work out why they're successful, but not always why they're unsuccessful. Yeah, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, plenty of coaches that, that I really rate highly over the years, you know, losing their jobs. And I've seen other coaches get appointments that I possibly think, you know, probably aren't, aren't, aren't the best coaches going around. And that, that, that's life. And, you know, sometimes politics has got to, to do with it. But, mm. you know, I think nine times out of ten, it's the quality of players, you know, that, that you coach. And, you know, you need, you need good players to win. Um, you know, it doesn't guarantee success, but it, it guarantees you the opportunity to get it, I suppose. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that is underestimated. I think your coach's impact, you know, when you win is, is too much credit. And when you lose, there's, there's too much emphasis on it, in, in, in my opinion. And, um, you know, that that's footy and that's the theatre of the game and that's why you know, I suppose everyone loves it. And, you know, it's – in the press, you know, or you, he's talking about the next coach being axed. You know, it's just just the way our game is, and it gets headlines, and and people like talking about it. The other thing too is you guys have both mentioned the responsibility of senior players in the success of a team, and the coach can't always get the right combination of that happening at a club for a whole range of reasons. It's not always the club's fault either, is there? I mean, clubs get outbid for players, um, so they can't always get the person they want, and then. The next person that's available on the market might not be the right fit. So it's a real puzzle and it's a team effort. Yeah, re- recruitment is, is essential. Um, you know, if you sign, sign the wrong player, it, it can take you years to recover as a club. Um, you know, you've you got to get it right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and what's, you know, that, that old saying, you know, you, you identify, you know, on talent, but you recruit on character, mm-hmm. you know, and, you re-sign them based on commitment. So, you know, a lot of clubs, they, are, they do the right thing, they identify the talent, but they recruit on the talent instead of on the character, and that's something that, you know, I know the Bulldogs are, are trying hard to, to get right. There are some pretty famous examples. Um, one of them was at Richmond uh, in the AFL of uh, a head coach who was on the verge of being sacked, but they changed the, uh, the staff around him and he went on to great success. I'm talking about Damien Hardwick, and there are others like that. Um, Rugby league is, I guess, very similar, Sam. If you, if you don't have the right people around you as well to complement your skills, and not every head coach has the same set of skills. No, that's right. There's like, yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's a puzzle. There's like so many variables. Um, you know, the recruiting, your, your junior base, um, you, I guess, things that are going to attract players to the club. Um, once you've got your squad together, you know, how do they gel? Um, you know, the characters of the guys. Mm-hmm. Um, like mm-hmm. I've had a few times in our, in our in teams I've been involved with where we've got the most amazing talented player or players, but just character wise, they're just letting the team down. Mm. And um, I always loved, um, you know, loved it was a love hate relationship, but I, I, I like to look back at um, that 2010 uh, st- um, Dragons team that Wayne Bennett had. Um, I didn't see them as star-studded i didn't see them as having all of the the best rep players in the game but as a team they just seem to work so well together um and which is why they got their success um so yeah i, I truly m- me if i was to um i've never coached before but if if i was to coach i would see myself choosing the character over the talent that's what i would like to think yeah you couldn't agree more and i, I actually saw neville costi in to hold kr um in you know, I used to pick his brain a bit about about St. George and Wayne Bennett and, um, you know, Neville's a real, you know, straight shooting guy he, he, and he basically just said he, he enjoyed going to training. That's interesting, yeah. Just enjoyed going to training and, and that's not know, a, that, that's not a light statement either because no. we're talking full-time professionals here. Yep. You're training a lot. It, it's a real routine and it can be a grind. So, yeah, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, it's keeping keeping everyone happy. Um, mm. is important and you know there's hard work to be on training and, and you know the boys I don't know if you come to training this much now Sam and Bill watch the boys but geez they train hard mm. they train hard I watched them the other and, day yeah yeah. you know it is hard work and, and how do you keep them happy I know winning helps <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> yeah. winning winning certainly does but you know you, you got to think of ways to you know add some variety I suppose and, and try and keep them motivated and inspired and, and that's a true Test, I suppose, of a coach. How, how do you inspire your team? How do you inspire your players? How can how can we get that extra one percent 
improving performance that can be the difference between winning and losing. And, and, and that's hard. And as Sam said, if you can figure that out, I suppose, <laughs> suppose you'll have a long career. Have you ever been to training and just not wanted to be there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, so two, two key moments was um, – uh, it was – I just had a blank. <laughs> well, one, one was definitely after our, our amazing 2012 season here with Desi. Um, you know, it was, it was amazing. Look, we trained, we trained the house down, mm. put in big hours, you know. Um, so the training was really tough. We're always in that red zone. You know, we had our heart mon- monitors on us all the time. Made sure we were sitting in the um, you know in the top percentage, but um, that next off season, you know, because I that what, what was that? That was my second grand final. Um, come back after that off season, then we're just getting flogged again, you know, and mm. it just seems so far away before we're going to be back out on that paddock and people are going to yeah. be cheering us. Yeah, I, there was a I think there was a slight bit of uh, depression there for me. I was <laughs> like, oh no, here we go. Got to listen to Des yelling at us and blowing the whistle, and you know. <laughs> Everything that comes with um, being under Desi. Um, yeah, well, and we'll then... talk more about that in the final sequence. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> what before we finish this point though? What's the hardest thing to coach, Craig? Off, I think it's just um, confidence and belief. Mm. Getting your players to believe, not only in themselves, but you know, in, in the game plan, in the structure, in, in the rest of their teammates. Mm. Um, so I think that's you know, if you can get the the players to to believe in themselves and and believe in the team and, and believe in the structures, um, you're halfway there. And that's, you know, the, the easy part's getting our training and, and teaching the skills, I suppose, and, and actually teaching the structure on that. But, you know, if, if you can somehow instill that belief and confidence in the players, oh, you're halfway there. I guess that gets back to the point you were making about that 2010 St George team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I um, I think Wayne Bennett's he's definitely very good at that. He um, We had him for a short period in the Kiwis. Um, and he came and he just seemed to make a huge difference in the whole the whole culture, the whole club, and the belief. Mm. And I saw him do it over the years with um, you know uh, team former teammates like um, Carmichael Hunt. Um, he was a kid that came from rugby union, didn't know too much about the game. And I just remember the very next season we'd all played Australian schoolboys and schoolboys together. The very next season he's running out first grade for the Broncos, and um, you know I remember Wayne Bennett, you know. Give him a slap on the back and say, "Go out there, mate. Just have fun. Do your thing." And um, yeah, that's that's amazing to me. Seeing an eighteen-year-old kid mm. going out there and just carving up. Does that become that. self-perpetuating after a while? Because you're actually because who the message is coming from, um, rather than I mean, anyone can pat him on the back and say that. I could say that to Carmichael Hunt as he's running on as an eighteen-year-old, but I'm not Wayne Bennett. It's interesting, isn't it? You can say the same words, but depends on who it's coming from. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Like, um, obviously. Wayne's been around a long time. He's had an awful lot of success, and you know what he says. You know, a young kid you'd think would mm. would fully take that on board. That's for sure. So over a period of time, um, the legend becomes part of of your arsenal of weapons when you're a coach, I suppose. Yeah. But that's that's not easy to build that, and very few have. No, it, it just you know how, how you build it. I suppose Bill is is a making the players know you care about them, mm-hmm. and, and b actually teaching them, yeah. showing them something, and. You know, I'll never forget my first day of Newcastle training. I went there as assistant coach. Adam McDougall came up to me, who was, was a very experienced player there, and he was probably only had a few more years left. And he said, Sam, I don't care what you've done, who you've played for, who you've coached. I want to learn something. Teach me something. Mm, mm. And most elite players just want to learn. They just want to get yeah. better. And if they can see that you care about them, and if they can see you actually showing them and, and teaching them something, then you get that respect. And once you get the respect, then what you say – Mm. They'll, they'll certainly try to do. I don't know, if, Sam, if that resonates with you at all. but I don't even have to add anything to that. I 100% agree. <laughs> Sam Perrick, Craig Sandercock, we're unleashed. And after the break, we'll talk a bit more about their history with this club and, and slightly with others. Let's talk about the dog days. This is Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Time for our regular history lesson with Craig Sandercock and Sam Perrett. We'll start with you, Sam. You joined the Bulldogs midway through 2012, which was turning out to be a very interesting season. But tell us about how you landed at Belmore. Yeah, so I was um, at the Roosters at the time, and, um, yeah, the manager said, mate, I think there's an opportunity. He, he knew I, was, I wasn't um, enjoying my footy at, at the Roosters at Why the time. Why was that? Oh, I just got a bit a little bit flat. Um I think uh, I was struggling with the culture at the time at the Roosters, um, and 
yeah, with the coaching staff, to be honest. I was really struggling with a lot of that and um, how things were being handled. And to be honest, I, I was almost ready to just to pull the pin on footy for that very reason. Mm. Um, I still love playing the game, but it was, yeah, just that environment being in there all the time. But, um, yeah, the manager ended up finding an opportunity and uh, it was uh, coming here to the doggies and, uh, I, you know, I never would have thought that ever would have happened in my career, um, you know, mid, mid, mid-season mid yeah. changing. Um, and just I think it was like only a couple of weeks before Chris and Inu, who was a, a yeah. good friend of mine, um, he had made the change. Oh, so you were actually mates when you both turned up at the club. That, that must <laughs> yeah, have helped. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. I guess the Kiwi connection, I suppose, the, the, yeah. Yeah, correct. And and through church as well. We, we grew up together in church as well. So, um, yeah, Chrissy was there. I think um, it was maybe only two weeks before I came to the Bulldogs. Yep. It was us playing the Bulldogs, and Chrissy absolutely carved us up on, on our side of the field. It's weird, isn't it? It is, it is strange. And then well, a couple of weeks later, I was, I was there next to him. Well, Andrew Davey played against the Dogs just – yesterday so uh at the time we record this show um so yeah that those things happen yeah. but uh, you joined the team at a time where they were actually making a real impression on the league desi had unexpectedly or expectedly depending on how strategic it all was <laughs> joined the club in 2012 not 2013 um and there there was this momentum going uh, all the way to the grand final what was that like oh it was amazing yeah so there's you know there's been a couple of times uh, in my career where I've just – you just – you know that feeling where the club, the whole club's humming, the whole mm. team is humming and there's just this buzz. You know, every time you're stepping on the field, you know the opposition's like, oh, we got these guys again. Um, and that was uh, when I started um, and, and certainly when I came here in 2012. And I think we um, – uh, from memory, we uh, we had stopped – what's the word? Team scoring tries against us. Yeah, yeah. We had yeah. the least. Yeah, we had yeah. the least tries scored against. Us. That's what I was yeah. looking for. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> nice. That, that's the Desi defense. Defense. Um, yeah, Correct. and 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 kind of uh, Desi was pretty famous uh, when he was coaching Manly prior to moving here for basically. Um, I used to call it attacking with your defense. In other words, you know, just just frustrating the opposing team so much you'd be basically defending your way out of your own territory, sort of thing. It was. Um, it was really a, a brick wall, and, and he brought that to the dogs pretty quickly, didn't he? Yeah, well, he had his, all of his uh, KPAs on the board and KPIs. and oh, he had was, drones and all sorts of things. Yeah, he had stuff going right. on everywhere. There was te- the most technical, technically advanced training sessions in, in history. It was, it was. Was there much of that at Hull Kingston Rovers at that time? Yeah, uh, not, not, not quite as much uh, <laughs> of that. I think we actually had a drone. <laughs> 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 Don't know if it worked or not, but we had one. <laughs> yeah. Well... You got to the grand final and um, I must say I was sitting in the stands. I wasn't even in the corporates. I was sitting in the stands with everyone else and with my kids and we were just devastated by that uh, result. Um, but anyway, uh, what went wrong? What, what, it, was a, it was one of those games where you just, I don't know, I, I felt like Craig Bellamy just had that team doing everything they needed to do to thwart us. Yeah, well, I, I know um, the feeling that I had on the field was there was there was a little bit of implosion and frustration amongst some of the players, the key players. Right. So I saw it, um, and that always frustrated me because I was like, you know, guys, it's it's hard enough when anyone, everybody's humming. It's hard enough to to win a game like mm. that, right? Mm. Um, let alone when you're um, when you're starting to you know crack and everyone's starting to have little digs at each other. So that's something that I did notice on the uh, on the game. Um, yeah, so that was frustrating. Uh, frustrating. I, tu- I truly believe that we underperformed that day. We we definitely could have won that game, and should have won. Um, but yeah, such as such as the NRL. Yeah, it's one of those things. A uh, lot of lot of people have really great careers, but never managed to win a grand final. Um, and and yours is one of them. Um, yeah. I hate to say that, mate, but it's just a fact. It was no. a, everything but basically. But there's a lot of guys in that category, as you would know. I'm yeah. sure you've had plenty of drinks with those those people you were in Hull uh we've mentioned uh, Craig came from a teaching background spent a lot of time at Manly as an assistant coach in various yeah. roles how did you get to Hull Kingston Rovers yeah I was, I was at Newcastle um at the time and I, I had I got an email about half halfway through the year um from from the owner of Hull KR the chairman of Hull KR saying I oh, would would I be interested in you know in coaching and I was emailing back yeah yeah, no worries, and that was it. Didn't hear anything back for months, and didn't even. Oh, I actually really? forgot about it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, 
got this phone call going on. We're in Australia next week. Would you like to be interviewed for the job? Uh, what? So it, was, it, was, it happened so quick. And I said, mate, how would you get my number? How would you, you get on to me? Because, you know, I'm pretty low profile. never played first grade. So I didn't have – I just worked hard. And, and, and they said, oh, Kurt Gidley did something or had a chat to us or whatever. Okay. And, yeah, then got interviewed for the job and – Basically, you know, got offered it there and then, like like that. Just happened so fast. Now, it's obviously a big step for an assistant coach, but even bigger to go to the northern hemisphere. Um, what were your thoughts at the time? Do you have any doubts, or were you jumping right in? Yeah, no, I had a lot of doubts. Um, obviously, had a had a young family at the time, and so you, you know, you're uprooting your whole family, and yeah, it's a big big decision. And you know, whole KR at the time wasn't. You know, it wasn't your Wigan or Leeds. It wasn't a really, really high-profile club. It was a good club. Mm. Um, you know, mid- mid-table club, I suppose, in Super League at the time. And, um, yeah, it was it was really hard hard decision. And, you know, Wayne, Wayne Bennett was just coming to Newcastle. Rick Stone had just left. And I was, you know, just negotiated to stay on at Newcastle at the time. Mm. And that was another, another tough conversation telling, telling Newcastle, uh, you know, I wouldn't be there. What did Wayne Bennett say? He wasn't too happy at the time and, um, yeah, I do remember I had a phone call with him and, you know, he expressed his disappointment um, at going and suggested, you know, whole car weren't a top club and, you know, he said, you know, basically, do you know why I've been so successful? And I thought, oh, my God, this is what I live for, <laughs> pearls of wisdom from, from the great man himself. <laughs> yes, because they had freaking good players and don't forget that. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it was interesting. But I, I did enjoy it. I learned a lot. Mm. Um, you know, there's there's less staff uh, over there, so you end up doing a lot of stuff stuff yourself. Um, it, was a, it was a really good experience. I enjoyed it. Uh, Josh um, Hodgson was in that side. Yeah, yeah Josh Hodgson, Mickey Payer. Uh, yep, used to play for the top. Yeah, Mickey, he's a good fella. He, he's a uh, we, we're based in East Hull, uh, Hull Kingston Rovers, and and you know Mickey Payer's nickname was a beast from the east, and they used to <laughs> chant his name. And you know, I don't know if you. He played in England much, Sam, but gee, the crowd, they get into it over there. They love it yeah. and they sing and they chant. And That's fantastic. Yeah, it's, a, it's awesome atmosphere. Uh, top eight in 2013 and um, you, you, you probably did very well with the list you had, and but it didn't go quite right after that. No, it's, um, you know, yeah, you, you know, when it's a little bit different over there. You don't have to spend up to the cap and, right. and our club didn't spend up to the cap, so you're always trying to – you know, sell players to other teams to try and make make some money, and and yeah, it's a, it is hard work. And uh, but that made me two, 2013. Nathan Brown's coaching St Helens. We played them in the semi final, and we scored a couple of tries early. And I thought, oh god, here we go. But they they, they got us got us in that in that semi final. <laughs> and Wayne Bennett's words probably came back to haunt you in a way when you heard about that not being able to spend up the salary cap, maybe to get the players that you, you needed, the missing pieces of the puzzle we talked about earlier. Um, Sam, you mentioned 2013. Um, that year started terribly, lost five of the first six games, but still managed to get through to the finals uh, with the Bulldogs. That, that was an interesting period there where, um, I don't know, there seemed to be something not quite right, like the team didn't seem to have quite the ingredients to win the premiership, but but Des and the commitment of the team kept dragging you to the finals. Uh, and 2014, we're talking about it in a tick. What, what was happening there? Uh, I can't put my finger exactly on it, but um, looking back, I do know 2012, everybody was just unified. We're mm. all going in the same direction, no arguments, um, no disputes. Everyone was in agreement. And then in 2013, I definitely felt like uh, there was, you know, there started to be some sort of rifts and um, yeah, some people were maybe a little bit fatigued or d- disagreed with things. Mm. Um, I, I know that did rear its head a little bit. Um, and I think um, – I'm not sure if you wanted to speak about this after, but 2016, I definitely feel like um, that was very player-led. And I, I do feel like there was um, – uh, again, there was, there was a bit of change in direction from the playing squad to the coaching uh, yep. staff. Yep. But ultimately, I, I believe that at the end it was the, the playing squad that ended up taking that um, 2016 wait was it 16 that was 14 14 sorry yeah the 14 the grand team. final correct mm. yeah and and very much Mick Ennis he was yeah, uh, right. he was instrumental in that yep and there was a bit of irony in that because I'm not sure if Mick was playing the sort of game at hooker that Des wanted him to I don't know but 
there was a lot of that going on anyway. I know there was a lot of talk mm. around that, but it's always hard. The media talk's not always accurate. That's well, I think problem. I think there was that was definitely a part of that conflict that was mm. going on between the playing squad and the the coaching staff. And it wasn't just Mick alone. Um, mm. I know there was a. It felt like there was a little bit of restriction to guys like Josh Reynolds. Mm. Um, you know, he was very um, creative, instinctive. He sort of had that X factor about him, and um, yeah, I, I felt that's that's what I felt. It's not an unusual situation, though, Craig. I mean, famously, back in the much earlier days at this club, there was talk about Steve Mortimer not being allowed to play his usual game uh, when Warren Ryan came in and took over the coaching. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but uh, there was that kind of conversation, and Steve was a very creative, open player, and 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 Warren, of course, had a very tight, disciplined side. Um, that's going way back, uh, and there are many other instances since then, which brings us back to the whole how hard is it to coach thing. Yeah, I suppose then, then that compromise comes in a little bit, I suppose. Um, you, you know, that you, you, you know, you're getting back to Steve Mortimer. I remember those days as well, and, you know, getting back to Grubb, who, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a great fella, and he's, he's right, he's off the cuff, and, you know, that, that's where as a coach, I suppose, that, that compromise comes in on it, and, and as a player. Mm. You know, try and reach a common ground, but yeah, I remember Sam. I was looking at it from afar in England, but I just remember you guys at Canterbury there, where you had that good little short passing game between your forwards, and mm. you know Benny Barber was was out the back of his mm. shape a lot. Yeah, it looked like you kind of were playing a little bit different footy than any other team from from afar. Mm. Uh, that, that that pretty well impressed me, and I was yeah, it would have been would have been nice to yeah to win playing a little bit differently to any every other team in the comp. That's how I was looking at it anyway not, from that's, afar. That's not easy to do these yeah. days, is it, when you think about it? As getting back to, again, the point we made about yeah. um, it, it's such a full-time game. The coaching is so finessed now that nearly everything someone comes up with is, has been counted within a couple of weeks. <laughs> well, yep. it's, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to find a point of difference between your team and the rest, and I guess that comes down to um, better players. <laughs> no, well, it, it does help, as we discussed. <laughs> yeah, you, you, and and then, but then again, what makes a better player? Um, and and ha, can you do that? Yeah. Um, so your last season was 2016, which is where we got that year from originally. And you made the finals again, but but how tough was it? Um, seeing the struggles this club's been through in the sort of post Des era and the, and the big rebuild and the long rebuild because of all the salary cap commitments. Oh yeah, it's been um, it's actually been quite um, heartbreaking to watch, um, but you know I guess understandable the way it all finished up and um, yeah, everyone's sort of taken the load since. So it, it has been hard to watch, especially knowing just you know what a proud club this is, everything that's been achieved here. Um, but in saying that, that's also um, the hope and faith. We all know that this club, it's only by its nature, it's going to get exactly back there where it, where it needs to be. Um, and yeah, we're we're on that track now. So um, nothing but faith that that's exactly what's going to happen again. Uh, you came back to to coach under Rick Stone at Newcastle, but eventually you landed in the middle of all the problems. Uh, uh, what was that like uh, being an assistant coach coming to the Bulldogs? You know what the club is, yep. and uh, and things not going well, and basically having your hands tied by, as I said, those salary cap commitments that we had. What give us an idea what that was like. Yeah, well, it wasn't easy, but um, you know the boys always always bought in, and, and they did train hard. And you know, if you look back on you know most of the games, they're very competitive, and, and they tried hard. It just just lacked a little bit of uh, of class in, in one or two key positions to to really win a couple of those close games we lost. And you know that's why Gus has come on board, and you know he's changed a few things in recruitment and retention, and bought some very good players. And not only that, the juniors um, mm-hmm. bought some very good kids and. You know, Matthew's team won the comp and, you know, some really high hopes some of those kids and, and I think that's the right balance that, that Gus and, and the recruitment staff have got, uh, you know, signing some class plays but also balancing that with signing elite juniors that can, that can you know, make their debut, I suppose, at, at the Bulldogs. And that that's the interesting point because we've, we've talked a lot about recruiting and bringing the right players into the club for a whole range of reasons but you, you're basically uh, at the mercy of the marketplace if you do that. So the alternative is what we're doing now, and that is build your own. It's obviously – and you're doing that with a construction company. You get a lot of satisfaction out of building your own. That's right. I suppose the um, – and this has happened to me as well. I guess the painful part is when you've uh, 
you put all this time and effort into into bringing up a young chippy, and then he gets poached by another uh, <laughs> yeah. another company. But well, that's true. In saying that, that's I think that's where the longevity is is when you've mm. got a uh, you got a junior base and you've got the culture all the way through. You know, mm. I know there's some fa- fantastic people here working with all of our junior players and junior system, um, the junior game here at the Bulldogs, and you know, and that includes past players, um, lifelong members. So. You know, you know, you start when when you're young. You're just bringing up that same that mm. same culture, that same belief, that same performance, um, and that's where you get the, the longevity. I think you've seen a few head coaches here in your time at the Bulldogs, and and you know, um, it's not always. Uh, I'm trying to find the appropriate word. It, it's not always fair when a coach parts with a club, um, um, and so you would learn a lot, I'd suppose, Craig, from just observing. Um, the way things work and your own experience, of course, at, at Hull. Yeah, certainly um, teaches you resilience, that's for sure. And um, being, you know, comfortable, being uncomfortable. But, you know, that that's footy, isn't it? You know, it's, it's as we alluded to right at the top top of the show, it's 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 a theatre, you know. It's it's what the press love talking about. And, you know, and sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, the more it's talked about in the media, the the, the more it seems to happen. But, you know, as I said, I've seen some really, really good coaches lose their jobs. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's footy. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your roster's like or what you perceive your roster to be like. If you don't get results, mm. you, you don't keep your job. And I suppose that's why it's important, you know, to consider, you know, who you're coaching and, and, and the blueprint, you know, for the future. And, you know, I, I relate it back Back to my to my teaching days, I suppose that you know not every kid that you teach is going to be get over ninety percent in the HSC, are they? Let's be honest, mm-hmm. they're, they're just not quite capable. But imagine if the principal said to you, Bill, you're teaching this class, every single kid gets over ninety percent, or you get the sack. <laughs> you know, you can it's only do like do what you can do. You might improve a kid that gets sixty percent mm-hmm. up to eighty, yeah. which is outstanding. Yeah, but sorry, Bill didn't get ninety. Off you go. Yeah. It's it's. You know, it's, it's a really hard thing and, and that's, I suppose, where, you know, you need to get your recruitment right. We discussed, you need to get your juniors right, as, as, as we are saying with Sam before, and, you know, it, it all comes together. Final word, I'll let you have that, Sam, if you don't mind. Uh, on You did imply that you thought this team, this club's going in, in the right direction and um, we've got blokes like Craig Sandercock in, in the coaching staff developing not only young men but young women now as players. So you think everything's going okay? Yeah, I think there's a lot to look forward to. I've, um, you know, some of the uh, the highlights that you've seen over the last few games is um, some really impressive talent coming through, um, and just that maturity. You know, mm. as you get maturity, as this team, um, as the culture develops as a team, you know, you'll start to get this more consistent, more mature performances. Um, I think our our squad's quite young on the whole, um, so you know, you watch them grow together. Um, that's going to be exciting, and I, I think from a young squad. That's probably what you're going to expect. It's going to take a little bit of time. Actually, I will give Craig the last word. Sandy, I, I, because you've made me think of something. Um, <laughs> you are building, of course, what we hope will be a very successful NRLW team for the Bulldogs in a couple of years. But you've also had a strong hand in the development of these kids you're just talking about, Sam. So I must ask you, um, you see guys like Khaled Rajeb and all these guys coming through. Um, you must get a lot of satisfaction out of that yourself. Yeah, 100%. And then I suppose that's that's a pleasure of coaching. He's, he's seeing kids... You know, developing the first graders, and, and I'll, I'll never forget. You know, the first person that played first grade that I coached when he was fourteen. You know, it's it's a, it's a pretty special feeling. And, and speaking of Carlity, I thought he was outstanding yesterday, and I, I think you know he can definitely you know have a have a good career in front of him. Craig Sandercock, Sam Perrett, thank you so much for being unleashed with us today. We'll do it all again next week. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.